world in colors that engenders a sense of the wonder of the world. And it is a post-colonial world in which the maps of empire are subject to a new cartography of revolutionary politics. The boyish wonder that the African American feels as he begins to see the world afresh through the eyes of the Haitian is the humane other side of that perverse imperial geopolitical enterprise so ruthlessly engendered by Columbus that has refigured the world in the colors and languages of Europe. Indeed, it is a Haitian's mastery of French, both oral and scribal, that elicits the African-American surprise question about identity and difference. As Jake sees Ray reading, he asks, how come you just plowing through this here stuff like that? I could never see no light at all in them print, chappy. Eh bien, mais vous compris beaucoup. Well, you understand a lot. Jake, whose travels in Europe during the war have allowed him a passing acquaintance with French, is bewildered by Ray's literacy in what is to him a foreign language. In response to Ray's question, you know French? Jake replies, parlez-vous, mademoiselle en Bézier, s'il vous plaît, voila. I learned that much often the frog is. Jake's limited knowledge of French is barely adequate for the art of seduction. Do you speak? Mademoiselle a kiss, if you please. <laughs> his French certainly cannot accommodate the elaborate social intercourse of his intellectual discussions with Ray. For McKay, himself a colonized product of Jamaica, the imperialist mathematics of divide and rule represents the African American as instinct and the West Indian as reason, or at least literacy. But to be fair to McKay, it is this very ethnocentric equation that he attempts to reformulate in the novel. For the image of Ray plowing through the text, put in the mouth of Jake, confirms not so much Jake's distance from Ray as the value of oral discourse itself as a form of intellectual inquiry as legitimate as literacy. Now, the African-American novelist and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston records in her account of African-American popular wisdom, Mules and Men, two narratives that are central to my analysis of the discourse of otherness, or how to figure the other nigger. <laughs> Hurston, as insider anthropologist, explores the cultural continuities between African-American and Caribbean peoples. The first narrative from Mules and Men is a folk tale which claims to reveal, quote, the reason niggers is working so hard, unquote. This is the way that was. God let down two bundles, by the way, my African-Americans speak with a decided Jamaican accent. <laughs> God let down two bundles about five miles down the road. So the white man and the nigger raced to see who would get there first. Well, the nigger outrun the white man, Safa Powell, and grabbed, I mean, you have your second, okay. All right. Well, the nigger outrun the white man and grabbed the biggest bundle. He was so scared the white man would get it away from him, he fell on top of the bundle and hollered back, oh, I got here first and this biggest bundle is mine. The white man says, all right, I'll take your leavings, and picked up the little teninchy bundle laying in the road. When the nigger opened up his bundle, he found a pick and a shovel and a hoe and a plow and chop axe. And then a white man opened up his bundle and found a writing pen and ink. <laughs> so ever since then, the nigger been out in the hot sun using his tools. And the white man been sitting up figuring, odds are odd, figures are figure, all for the white man, none for the nigger. <laughs> A straight reading of this tale suggests simply the nigger's self-mockery, a kind of therapeutic laughing at his own naivety, which results in his entrapment by the figure and white man, whose control of the technology of writing facilitates his acts of exploitation. But a subversive reading of the text turns this tale into a parable that voices the African-American's capacity to analyze in metaphor his, her deliberate exclusion from the educational system. 
the tale cleverly reveals that it is not figure in itself so much as the political uses to which figuring is put that is the nigger's problem. Furthermore, the technology of writing is at times inadequate in some acts of self-representation that do require voicing. This is clearly illustrated in another narrative from Mules and Men, the tale of the educated girl who is, quote, all finished up, unquote. I know another man with a daughter. The man sent his daughter off to school for seven years. Then she come home all finished up. So he said to her, daughter, get your things and write me a letter to my brother. So she did. He says, head it up, and she done so. Now tell him, dear brother, our child is done come home from school and all finished up, and we's very proud of her. Then he asked the girl, is you got that? She told him, yeah. Now tell him some more. Our mule is dead, but I got another mule. And when I say, he moved from the word. Is you got that? He asked the girl. No, sir, she told him. He waited a while and he asked her again, you got that down yet? No, sir, I ain't got it yet. How come you ain't got it? Because I can't spell. <laughs> you mean to tell me you've been off to school seven years and can't spell? <laughs> Why, I could spell that myself and I ain't been to school a day. Well, just say and he'll know what you mean and go on with the letter. <laughs> now this hilarious image of the educated girl who is all finished up brings a gender perspective to the racial, ethnic, linguistic, oral, scribal versions of otherness. The other keeps on changing, as do the answers to the question, ain't you, ain't you one of us too? The politicized roles of mule and man, beast of burden and privileged writer are reversible. The illiterate father's confidence that he can spell the clocking sound, he's not at all finished up, is a compelling assertion of an ingenuous voice that does not require literacy for its articulation. Incidentally, the Oxford English Dictionary defines the figurative sense of the word spell in this way, quote, to find out, to guess or suspect by close study or observation, unquote. This unlettered man can spell in the non-literal sense of the word. He has access to a knowledge system that predates the culture of the book. In the beginning was a word, and the man, as much as a mule, is moved from the word. I now turn from literature and folk wisdom to popular music as a vibrant articulation of Pan-Africanist consciousness. Much of the cultural production of Africans scattered across the globe, particularly music, has functioned as a means of celebrating a shared heritage and a common history of struggle against multiple isms and schisms, racism, colonialism, and imperialism. For example, reggae, which has its origins in a small island state in the Caribbean, articulates a global African consciousness that transcends insularity. Reggae is a globalizing discourse that embraces both the continental and the diasporan. And I must use this opportunity to advertise our conference on global reggae, which takes place at the University of the West in Mona next year from February 18 to 24. I hope some of you will find it possible to come. Now, the land mass of Jamaica, and mass is a definite exaggeration in comparison to the expansive landscape of the African continent. The land mass of the island does not contain us. Though physically bound on all sides,